Good morning, church. Happy to be in God's house today. I love his presence. And I love when he just shows up and meets with us and is faithful to do so. And I'm just so, so honored and thankful to be here with you today. If I have not met you, my name is George. I'm part of the leadership of Redemption Church. And um, it's just an honor and a privilege every time I get to bring the word this morning. And we get to do kind of a little one-two punch, uh, Jason and I. And this week is starts a two-part uh, thought on timing, God's timing, and what it means to trust God in his timing. And I think it's so amazing that uh, God really, in the mystery and all of the things that he is, is just so full of goodness and graciousness and awesomeness. I don't know how else to say it. He's awesome. And I'm just so honored to be able to share the word with you and, and help as Jason and I have collaborated this uh, last week on the, the message this morning, it's uh, just such an honor to be with you. So um, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Matthew chapter 13. The verse will be on the screen, but I still like to open a Bible every now and then, don't you? Matthew 13, verse 30. Let both grow together until the harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned. Then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. Jesus teaching a parable is speaking specifically about a field where a farmer has sown. The farmer has sown Wheat, something that is good for good pleasure, that's honorable, that is for sustenance for his workers and the people of the land. And in this parable, for sake of time, we're not going to go through every little detail, but an enemy came in the night and sowed another seed right alongside the good seed. And that was called the weed or the tares. See, this weed that was sown was a seed that was similar to wheat, but slightly different when you begin to unpack what was happening. And Jesus, teaching this parable, says that as the workers of the field came to the farmer, they said, did you plant bad seed? The farmer said, no, this must have been an enemy. But don't uproot everything right now because the wheat still has to grow. The good has to continue to grow even though there's bad. And at the right time, we will separate the two. See, all throughout this series that we are in right now, we this main idea we are talking about is that I will govern my time, my talent, my treasures better so I can give my time, talent, and treasures better. Last week, if you remember, Danielle preached an awesome message all about our view of the master, the parable of the talents, where one gets a few and another gets a lot, but at the end of the day, our view of our master informs us of what we will do with what he has given us. The stewardship principle comes really from a place of how do I view the master who has given me these things. For we know that God sent his son Jesus, right? To be an example for life, for our salvation, to live a certain way and so we could live in eternity with God. For Jesus came into the world and he preached his gospel, the good news, and that, folks, is our good seed. He is the sower. He is the farmer. And he has sown good seed. For we who sit here who call ourselves believers and Christians, we eat that good seed. Amen? For we know what that good seed is. But just like there's good seed in the soil, see, there is an enemy who plants bad seed right next to it. And this happens in life. But see, the strategy in the parable 
is not to rid the field of the bad seed. The strategy here is that at the right time, they will be bundled and taken away. The strategy is all about timing. It's not about what, but rather when. And I would say that as we walk with Christ, our faith a lot of times gets jumbled in the what. When Christ really says, just believe for me when. Believe for me when. See, when we talk about timing, timing is the only thing in the kingdom that we cannot reproduce or multiply more of. Which is why it's the most frustrating aspect when it comes to our relationship with God. See, I can invest more. I can earn more. I can do more. I can make more except time. My talent and my treasure, I can reproduce. I can be a steward of to reproduce more of. I've preached this before. Stewardship is, biblical stewardship, the definition is multiplication of God's resources. In order to be a good steward, you are called to multiply what God has given you. But in this one area between the three we are talking about in this series, time, talent, and treasure, one of these is, see, a level playing field. One of these is something that I just have to trust God more in because I can't do anything about it. And that's time. See, an eternal God, Outside of time, God was before time, God is during time, and God will be after time. He's eternal. God created time. God is not bound by time. He created it as a mechanism for us to measure our lives. But God is not bound by the average today 83 or 85 years of life expectancy we have on this earth. He doesn't create man and woman and say, man, I hope in 80 years from now they do a lot for me. God is eternal. God created humans as eternal beings, in fact, to live with him forever. Humans screwed it up. <laughs> and we, because of stupid decisions, now created separation and now we use this mechanism called time to measure the amount of time we are away from God. But God in his eternal principle actually says, you're going to be either away from me forever or with me forever. Eternity is inevitable, folks. Where you spend it depends on what you believe. And we as Christians know that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And now we have to live in trying to trust in God's timing. And I know that that is easier said than done. See, trust is what is tested when understanding God's timing. There's three points that I want to share with you today as we talk about trusting in God's timing and believing for God. They're not on the screen. I just wrote these down as I was preparing for this because as someone who likes to preach and speak, I mean, there's got to be some points. So here we go. Here's the points. Number one, <clears throat> excuse me, number one, to help you recognize, to help you trust in God's timing, number one is to recognize the mystery of God's timing. The mystery of God's timing. Number two, recognize the lesson of God's timing. And number three, recognize the strength in trusting God's timing. Number one, the mystery. Recognize the mystery. See, time is, I believe, the greatest mystery of all God's eternal principles and laws. That's why we don't understand it fully. That's why we can't wrap our minds around eternity. When you think of, I'm going to live forever, your brain gets to a point. And then it just can't think any further. Theologians, scientists, philosophers have tried so hard to unwrap the definition of what is eternal life. But we cannot do so. It's a mystery, friends. And that's okay. It's okay. 
Why? Ecclesiastes 3.1 says, There is a time for everything and a season for every activity under the heavens. God's timing is a mystery that surpasses our human understanding. Just as there is 24 hours in a day, I would call that natural timing, right? We can measure that. But there are divine encounters throughout our life that happen outside of just the regular 24 hours we all have. I call that divine timing. And we must recognize from God's perspective that there is something far greater than our natural timing. It's our divine timing. It's the God encounters that happen. That doesn't depend on whether I was a good Christian this week or a bad Christian this week. That doesn't depend on whether I came to church and sat in the front row or the back row. That doesn't depend on whether I served in church or not. God's timing is perfect. God's timing is is not anything I can control, and divine timing is something that I have to slow myself down and recognize that there is some mystery here, but the mystery is that his timing is perfect. See, oftentimes, when we think about God's timing, he's a lot slower than us. Amen? One of my favorite pastors of all time says, we have a lot of microwave Christians serving a crockpot God. I wish I came up with that. It's true. And I think it's more true as time goes on. Because we want everything right now. Instant gratification is something humans have always wanted, yet now it's more attainable than ever. Technology makes things so attainable, so fast, that instant gratification that was days to get years ago when I had to walk somewhere, I can get within minutes when I drive. Or now I can get within seconds when I FaceTime somebody. Or I can shoot out an email real quick and get a response back. We are conditioned for microwave God. But we don't serve a microwave God. One of the most famous marketing ads of all time is Burger King's You Can Have It Your Way. You can just come up to the drive-thru, order whatever you want. I order a rodeo cheeseburger. I love those. If you don't know what those are, I just help you out. Go order one after church today. And I can walk or drive up to the drive-thru, pay my couple bucks, and get my instant gratification. I mean, it's everywhere, friends. It's everywhere. But God says most of the time, at least for me, maybe you're different than I am. Slow down, George. Slow down. Because it's in these moments of waiting where I have to build my faith, where I have to trust in God more. We must learn to surrender our desires to his plan and his timing. That's called delayed gratification. I talk about this a lot when I meet with clients and we talk about personal finances and we talk about savings and people ask me all the time, like, what, do I, what am I supposed to do? How am I supposed to save? How am I supposed to invest? All of these things. And there are things, you know, practically you can do. But the number one thing, and I tell everybody this, the number one mentality you have to have to be successful in creating wealth is exercising delayed gratification. See, the problem with people and why they go into debt and not save and invest is because they want it right now. So you get a credit card to buy the thing that you want right now and mortgage your future because you don't want to delay the gratification in which you could buy that thing later without the credit card if you just save. But we don't want to save. We want it right now. We do this with God. We do this all the time with God. God, I need you right now. I need it right this second. God, if you would just come through for me today, I promise I'll change tomorrow. But I need you right this second. See, I think trusting in God and what God's will is for our life 
is far less about doing something or the what and far more about the when, the timing. See, I grew up in the Christian church my whole life. I was in church six to seven days a week, Christian school from kindergarten through undergrad, and I was obsessed with God. What is your will for me? If I could just do the right thing for God, if I could talk to some young people for a moment, I propose that you stop thinking for an answer about what you're going to do and rather get into alignment with God's timing on when you are going to do it. See, what freed me as a young person wasn't that I was going to be a doctor or a lawyer or a pastor or a musician or a financial planner. Rather, I was freed when I aligned myself in God's time frame. And I understood, rather, my faith is built in the when, not the what. You will be freed from the pressure of doing the right thing from God when we rest in knowing God's timing will occur when he wants it to. I just have to tune into that. And how do I do that? Through trusting him. Genesis 41, 14 through 16, very famous story of Joseph and probably one of the best examples of God's timing in the Bible. Genesis 41, 14, it's on the screen. So Pharaoh sent for Joseph and he was quickly brought from the dungeon when he had shaved and changed his clothes. He came before Pharaoh and Pharaoh said to him, I had a dream and no one can interpret it. But I have heard it said of you that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. I cannot do it, Joseph replied to Pharaoh, but God will give Pharaoh the answer he desires. Point number two, recognize the lesson of God's timing. See, was Joseph's job, was God's will for Joseph a dream interpreter? Was that it? See, I think if you and I had that ability, we would put a sign in our front lawn, decline every job offer we ever got, and said, I'm a dream interpreter. This is God's will for my life. And I'm going to put my stake in the ground, and I'm not going to pursue any other opportunity because this is what God has given me to do, and this is the will for my life. And I don't know why I'm broke, but I'm broke. God, I don't get it. Was Joseph's call just that? No. See, it's funny as that it's funny to hear it that way, but that's what we do, friends. We do it all the time. I talk to countless people who say, I'm going to quit my job to pursue X because that's what God called me to do. You're broke. Go ahead and pursue what God called you to do. I'm all for it. But could it be that you're in that job making a living so you can do the thing that God called you to do? Is it possible that it's not about the what, but rather the when? Musicians in the room. I love you. I am one. And I wish I pursued a musical career professionally. I didn't. You know why? Because it didn't pay the bills. But I love to play. And I knew that God could still use the talent and the ability right there in that little glass cage every single week for people. And I pour out my ability, my talents for God to reproduce. See, I, I prayed about it all the time as a little kid. I mean, I played the drums in church since I was six years old. In children's church at a church in Schenectady, I promise you, I remember the first Sunday school service, I played the drums. It was an electric drum set, this tiny little drum set. And I was six or maybe seven. And I remember my friend who was much older than me, and he was sitting next to me, and he would clap just to make sure I was staying in time. I mean, that's how young I was in children's church playing the drums. And see, I could have said 10 years later, playing in church and all over the place, this is what God has called me to do. So I'm going to stop pursuing university. I'm going to stop pursuing my nine to five job and I'm going to put my stake in the ground. Friends, hear me. I'm not saying that that's a bad thing, but the point is the perspective of when. 
See, I continued to try all different things and balance my life. And I got to a place where I finally went to college and I was uh, paid to be a professional musician. I got to do it. It wasn't about the what, it was about the when. All throughout the Bible, we find numerous examples of people who face challenging circumstances while waiting for God's timing. See, Joseph spent years in prison before elevated to a position of authority despite hardships, Joseph remained faithful and trusted God's plan. Our job is to learn that in the midst of uncertainty, God is working behind the scenes. I don't know why Joseph was in prison for as long as he was. I don't know. I don't know why he was thrown in a pit and then was sold into slavery and then was thrown into prison, and then was a leader of a house and a nation. I don't know why it took so long. And I hope one day I can ask him, bro, do you know why it took so long? Can you explain to me why it took you this long to be elevated, to be recognized? See, I don't know, but I do know this much. The story of Joseph is littered with this one phrase, but God was with Joseph. So it wasn't about the what, because God was with him. It was about the when. Our job isn't to figure out how, what. Our job isn't even to figure out when. Our job is to simply trust. The biblical lesson in trusting God's timing is simply that, trust his timing. For we understand that it is a mystery, and we understand that it's hard to do, but that's where faith comes in, and that's where strength, point number three, comes in, the strength in trusting God's timing. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, I love this verse. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge or submit to him and he will make your path straight. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. I would say in 2024, we put so much weight on human understanding. Why? Because we can see it 24-7, 365. You trust the person who sounds legit on your Instagram feed more than Jesus sometimes. I do too. That's a preaching point to myself. Because sometimes it just looks so perfect. Like, wow. Wow. I, I was talking to somebody the other day who was trying to explain to me a concept in finance that I know to be a little sketchy, okay? I went to school for finance. I have a degree in it and a few different certifications. I've dedicated my life to this. And this person was explaining to me, for purposes of confidentiality, I'm not going to get into what it was, but they were explaining to me a concept in finances that they thought was a really great investment. And I said, where did you hear about this? And this person said, YouTube. <laughs> Hold on, it's funny, it's funny, but we all do this. YouTube. I said, really? Who on YouTube told you to do this? And she, this person said, well, this guy said that you know, if you do X, Y, and Z, and I put this much money over here, and I use this account, that it's a really great investment, that I will be able to have this for life. And I said, it's not 100% wrong, but it's not 100% right. See, that person was selling you a plan to follow for them to make a little bit of money. The true strategy actually removes that person 
And you can do that strategy in a little bit different way over here to really gain wealth. But see, this individual I was talking to was convinced that this was the right way to do it. In fact, argued with me that, you know what, I'm just, thank you, George, for your opinion, but I'm going to do it this way. Why? Because that dude can sell a heck of a lot better than I can. But in all reality, friends, we trust where we see confidence. If someone is confident, you will trust them. If I told you something you didn't fully understand and sold it to you with 100% confidence, you say, wow, George is a pretty smart guy. I should do that. That doesn't mean I'm correct. You know where there is 100% confidence all the time? God's word. And what does God's word say? Not on our own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge or submit to God. Submission to God is, I believe, the greatest facet of spiritual maturity in your life. The conduit to which you grow as a Christian is through submission. You can be saved and be going to heaven and I'll see you there. But if there is not continual submission to the Holy Spirit that lives inside of you, you cannot mature as a Christian. You cannot. To strengthen our trust in God and his timing, we first have to surrender our own understanding and our perspective and submit to the ways to God for he will guide. And we know that God is never late God is never early. He is right on time. Don't focus on the what, rather focus on the who. Or excuse me, the when, sorry. When God does it, I don't know. And neither do you, and that's okay. But he will. We just sang about how faithful he is and how worthy he is and how right he is. So he'll do it, friends. That's where the faith comes in. The faith comes into the perspective of when God does it, he will get the glory. I don't know when, and I don't know how, and I don't know what, but when he does it, he will get the glory. If I knew when he was going to do it, I would get the glory. And if I get the glory, what the heck is the point? But he will get the glory. God's timing requires us to trust him completely. Matthew 13, 30, and I'm closing with this. Steve, you can come back up. Let them both grow together, Jesus said, at the right time, I will tell the harvesters. First collect the weeds and bundle them to be burned. Here's why, friends. The weed that was sown. Today we would call that, it's actually a, it's actually a real weed. It's called Darnell. Sorry if your name's Darnell. <laughs> it's called Darnell. And this weed is actually a lot like wheat. From afar, it actually looks the same. But when you get up close and the ears start to pop, the actual seeds begins to form what you would eat. There's a seed inside of this weed that is actually toxic and poisonous to consume. But again, from afar, it looked just like it. The farmers, the workers came to the farmer and said, did you plant bad weeds, a bad seed? Because I noticed this poisonous weed in there. Do you know how intimately knowledgeable they would have had to have been on wheat to see the counterfeit? And the counterfeit didn't pop up at the beginning. 
We understand farming to a degree. It takes time, right, to grow. But once it grew, we had to get to a place of understanding that, wait a second, this is false and this is right. There's poison here if I'm not careful. But that's what the enemy wants to do to your life, friends. He wants to take you out. He wants to poison you in whatever way possible. The good seed, the wheat that we have to eat in order to be nourished, the Bible, the word of God, nowadays can really look like a counterfeit. But the strategy isn't remove all of the bad right now. That's not. It seems admirable and it seems like the right thing to do, but Jesus gave us an awesome, awesome understanding here. Don't focus on that. Just continue to grow. Continue to grow. Continue to produce the good because at the right time, I will take out the bad. It's not my job to take the bad out. It's the job of the farmer, he said, at the right time, I will tell the harvester, remove the bad. Burn it. Get rid of it. Produce and continue to grow in the good. I want to leave you with this story. There have been so many times in my life that I have noticed this happen where good is growing and bad is growing at the same time. I mean, we're humans, right? I am not perfect at all. <laughs> and any pastor who tells you that they're a pretty darn good person, I'd question. But I do know this much. Throughout my life, there have been times when, when, at the right time, God removed the bad. In 2002, I went from four kids in my sixth grade class to 30. I grew a little bit. In 2009, I went from 300 kids in my whole school to 30,000 kids in my graduating class. I grew a little bit. In 2013, I found a large financial firm and I started as a temp, as a seasonal employee. I was beginning to grow a little bit. In 2015, while traveling with an evangelist, we stopped traveling and we planted a tiny little church in Schenectady. In 2016, I moved to California, found an amazing church and began to grow there, continuing to grow. In 2019, I moved back to New York, left the, left the corporate world and started my own practice in 2020. In 2022, I met the love of my life and I grew even more. In 2023, I moved my solo practice to an amazing team of financial planners. And in 2024, who knows? But in prepping this sermon this morning, I was brought back to those little points. And I don't have time to get into what every single one of those meant, but I do know this much. Every time the wheat and the weeds needed to be separated, God did it. I didn't do it. Because at the right time, God removed something and I grew. And I continued to grow. And then the weeds started to come back up. And at the right time, God removed them again. And I began to grow. And at the right time, God removed them again and again and again and again. Why do I share all of that? Because there always is going to be a change. And it's not about the what. It's about the when. And it's about the God of the when. When you trust in him, you can embrace the mystery you can recognize the lesson and you can strengthen your faith in knowing that he is always working for your good. God is good. And his love endures forever. Trust in his time. bow our heads and close our eyes in this place. Maybe you're in here and for the first time 
you're saying, George, that's awesome, but I don't know who to trust in. His name is Jesus, and he will change your life forever. And if you're in the room or watching online and you've never put your faith or your trust in him first, and you want to this morning, can you please raise your hand so I can see it and we can pray for you? If you would say, George, that's me. I need to trust in Jesus. I need to start this walk that I can begin to trust. Second, if you're in the room and you say, George, I've been walking quite a long time, but Holy Spirit has given me perspective this morning. I need to drop the what and trust in the when. If that's you, can I see your hand as well so I can pray for you this morning? If you would say, I need that when. Thank you. Thank you for those hands. Father God, we love you. And we say thank you so much for who you are. We say thank you so much for what you have given us. For the things that we cannot comprehend. The goodness and the grace and the mercy. We say thank you. Thank you for your compassion. And Father, thank you for sending your son Jesus that I may live with you for eternity. Thank you for dying for my sins, God, and cleansing me and making me new. Now I recognize you as Lord and Savior. And God, I pray that as we continue to move forward, as we continue to grow in you, that we be reminded, Father, that it's not about the what it is not about specifically when exactly, God, but it's about putting my faith and my trust in knowing that your timing is perfect. For you are a good God and you do not withhold from us. And we worship and we honor you and we give you praise. In the mighty name of Jesus.